Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's regular Friday program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I will be your host today. When I Google the words memory bank, I find innumerable variations on the theme a memory bank is a designated section of computer memory used for storing data. Yes, of course, that I understand. If we remove the word memory, we all know that a bank is a place where we may store our money and perhaps valuable and cherished possessions in a safety deposit box. But what about the memory bank we all strive to hold on to as we age into our senior years? Clicking further, I find, quote, people use their prior knowledge of a bank as a place where people keep their money safe and therefore a memory bank is where people store and keep safe reminder notes for the things they need to remember. Sounds like an advertisement for post-its. <laughs> but in one way, I guess that's exactly what a memory bank is. A large court board with hundreds, maybe thousands of post-its of varying colors and of all sizes, perhaps randomly slapped on or much better, certainly, organized by type of reminder or even arranged chronologically based on when in life the mind has whispered, remember this moment, this fact, this experience. I'm not really one who lives in the past. Well, let me refine that statement. I often think of a handful of significant people in my past that have had a particular impact on my life and are no longer walking beside me. But I don't dwell on the past. That is, Except in the deep sleep early morning moments of my dreams, where my brain seems to randomly select people from different times and places in my life, placing them where they don't quite belong, but usually they're under pressure to solve a challenge in an impossibly limited amount of time. My uh, therapist and my neurologist are working on that, mostly merry matching of who, where, what, and why. So I'll leave it to them. But curiosity does usually get the best of me. I introduce you to French philosopher Jean-Paul Gustave Ricoeur. Oh, like art. He preferred simply being called Paul, so we'll go with that. 1913 to 2005, who had some fascinating things to say about memories. Allow me to share just a couple. Turning memories dial, we are between unhappy memory versus happy forgetting unhappy memory versus happy forgetting today's author in the spotlight elaborates on that thought from his own personal experience he says that quote unhappy memory all too common is when the past arises from the grave and arrives armed and lethal, seeking revenge or justice. He goes on to say, 
I prefer justice, the condition for happy forgetting. When the fatal and fateful past, satisfied, returns to a peaceful slumber from which it will not rise again. And finally, but if we have happily forgotten, how will we know the fact of our own amnesia? Well, that's all a bit more complicated than my memory bank thought. <laughs> But it's surely food for thought. Our author today speaks from vivid and frightening experience with a bank full of unhappy memories and fortunately some happy forgetting. Our book exploration today begins in 1975 when the author at age four experienced first one confusing and hurried escape from pending danger, only to be followed by another escape, far, far more life-altering. Some of the memories of both uprootings live too vividly as unhappy. A few fall into the cherished safety deposit box labeled happy, and still others, fortunately, are happily forgotten. In 2016, 41 years after his harrowing experience of escaping south from North Vietnam, and later from Saigon to America, with few minutes to spare, Viet Tan Nguyen wrote his first novel, The Sympathizer, and won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. The book follows a half French, half Vietnamese man serving as a spy for the communist forces in the final days of the Vietnam War. Five years later, in 2021, he published his second novel, The Committed, as a sequel to The Sympathizer. NPR spoke highly of the book, as did all other reputable sources. Allow me to quote, with smoke and mirrors panache, the committed, the Etan wins sequel to the sympathizer, continues the travail of our European Ulysses, now relocated to France and self-identified as Vaudan, which literally means nameless. Having survived a communist re-education camp, a perilous sea crossing, and a long sojourn in an Indonesian refugee center. He arrives in Paris on July 18, 1981, the birthday of Nelson Mandela, to become, once again, a refugee. That our hero arrives four days after Bastille Day is significant. For the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity have proven elusive in France's former colonies, and it would take a visionary of Mandela's stature to give them new life. End quote. Wynne's eagerly awaited third book, A Memoir, was published a short 36 days ago on October 3rd. Danae's new book in the November spotlight is titled, A Man of Two Faces, A Memoir, A History, A Memorial. But before exploring the story told, let us consider some facts about the author. Viet Tan Nguyen, 
it's spelled N-G-U-Y-E-N, but not according to NPR, Nguyen, which is usually pronounced with that way, is pronounced Win, W-I-N. Viet Tan Win was born in March of 1971 in Ban Mi Wat, or Duat, spelled T-H-U-O-T, Duat, a small village in the north of Vietnam. Quoting the author, its name changed by the victors along with many other things. Wynn notes, quote, you remember nothing of what the New York Times called a sleepy, charming highlands town where the last emperor, Bao Dai, once had hunting lodges. By the time you were born, American military advisors occupied those lodges. American-made jeeps and trucks rumble through paved two-lane roads and streets driven by Southern soldiers. The town was little more than a village with dirt roads known for its coffee, its waterfalls, and its ethnic minorities, end of quote. The kin, K-I-N-H, are the ethnic minority in Vietnam at the time, an imperial warlike people who marched south from China to seize the land of the Cham, the Cambodians, and the Moi of North Vietnam. Quoting again, once the colonizers now colonized by the French before the Americans. In 1975, everything changed. The story unfolds ahead. Wynne and his family eventually find themselves at Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, one of four such camps for Vietnamese refugees. From there to another in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for three years. Seeking better economic opportunities, his parents then moved to San Jose, California and opened the first Vietnamese grocery store in the city. Still a rough place to live, at least the downtown area where Viet's parents worked. Viet attended St. Patrick's School and Bellarmine College Preparatory in San Jose. After high school, he briefly attended UC Riverside and UCLA before settling on UC Berkeley, where he graduated degrees with degrees in English and in ethnic studies. He stayed at Berkeley for a PhD in English, moved to Los Angeles for a teaching position at the University of Southern California, where he has been ever since. Viet serves on the board of the International Rescue Committee and is actively involved with promoting the arts and culture of Vietnamese in the diaspora through the Diasporic Vietnamese Artists Network and Diacritics, Devon's blog for which he is the publisher. Diacritics features book, film, and art reviews essays and commentaries, interviews with artists and writers, travelogues, and more, all dealing with the cultural production of Vietnamese in the diaspora. Wynne is a university professor, A. Roll Arnold Chair of English, and Professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity, and comparative literature at USC. Amazing. In addition to winning the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2016, he was also recognized a year later with a MacArthur Genius Grant and a Guggenheim Fellowship. His writings, including novels, nonfiction books, short story anthologies, and even a children's book, have received the Carnegie Mellon for Excellence in Fiction, 
Le Prix de Meilleur Livre Étranger, Best Foreign Book in France, a California Book Award, and the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature in Fiction from the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. Viet was also a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction. Viet Thanh Nguyen is also the author of Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War from Harvard University Press in 2016 as well. Nguyen lives with his wife, Lan Duong, and their two children in Pasadena, California, a long way from North Vietnam. To the book, A Man of Two Faces, a memoir, a history, a memorial. I start with a quote from Leila Lalami, the reputed author of The Other Americans, finalist for the National Book Award, who says, a searing and sensitive memoir on the long shadow that was cast on those who managed to survive it. This book is a work of love and anger and care, and it will resonate with everyone who has lost a home. Barely four, when he left Vietnam with his parents and older brother shortly before the fall of Saigon, in April of 1975, Wynne retains no memory of his harrowing transoceanic crossing, but he clearly remembers the trauma of being separated from his parents during their early resettlement period in the United States. The family had to be split up among several households as there seemed to be no sponsor that could take them in as a single unit. This first psychic awareness of the fall of Eden, engineered by a force greater than his parents, would foretell other schisms, separating Wynne from his parents' seemingly heroic resilience and their unwavering Catholic faith. As owners of Saigon Moy, a Vietnamese market in pre-gentrified downtown San Jose, California, his parents would inevitably face the job-related casualties of racism and violence while leaving their preteen son presumably safe at home among his English language books and TV dinners. Unbeknown to them, mostly due to the language barrier, Wynne was exposed to questionable cultural knowledge. The dehumanizing violence depicted in American war movies against Vietnamese, particularly. His parents thought they were protecting their son from the dangers he could not see, while the son wanted to protect them from the knowledge they did not need. As an adolescent, Wynne's sense of alienation formed a double consciousness. When does duality become duplicitousness? When does having two selves lead not to double vision, but to self-deception? This this constant vigilance helps Wynne deeply develop a critical distance when assessing his refugee history against a multivalent context. His tenuous hold on his Vietnamese past found purchase in the notion of post-memory, unwitnessed trauma that nevertheless gets reproduced as accepted reality through repeated, if fractured, storytelling from survivors to third parties. Due to the dominant culture's distorted and biased view on history, the dominant culture, of course, being America, 
inheritors of secondhand memory, those who were not witness to the original event, but learn about the past through literature or visual media, may uncritically absorb the dominant view of history and then become unwittingly complicit in furthering the original unaddressed trauma or injustice. Even as parents who lost both home and land by leaving are not exempt from wind's penetrating gaze. For one, the land where their home stood formerly belonged to various indigenous groups who had lived in the Vietnamese Central Highlands for centuries. He also touches upon the fact that in fleeing Vietnam, his parents left behind Wynne's adopted teenage sister, creating an enduring void that he identifies as an absent presence. Wynne's view on personal agency naturally leads to his caution against facile representation of the other, skeptical of any American writing that romanticizes an individual struggle from hardship to success, he observes that there is still a gap between empathy and experience. Empathy cannot turn a son into his father and mother, but if the son is also a father, even so. Nevertheless, when his mother suffered a mental breakdown during his sophomore year at Berkeley, Wynne experienced a seeming loss of memory, as if he was inextricably linked to her consciousness. Thus, her temporary departure from reality also exiled him into an abyss. In my humble opinion, having read the book cover to cover, for me, reading A Man of Two Faces was a rocky road. It is indeed blistering and unconventional, as noted by the book's publisher. It is not a memoir in a classic sense. Wynn expands the genre by acknowledging larger stories of refugeehood, colonization, and the idea of Vietnam and America, also with trademark sardonic wit, very incisive insights, and of course, deep emotional openness about his life as a father now and as a son. Wynne's solidly placed sense of duality forces him to write in the second person present, though through most of the book, actually, as in the sentence, you remember a black and white photograph. Second person present, not you or I remember. Remembered. As the memoir progresses, he leads first toward the third person present, he, and finally, toward the end, he moves to the first person, past and present appropriate. Distinctive, too, about the book is the insertion of personal thoughts and comments about the narrative he has just written. But placed at the right margin of the page, with the words and sentence lengths to form patterns of squares or rectangles, sometimes triangles, sometimes even a single word. It's the thought that he shares in reaction to what he just wrote on the page, this duality him being two people takes a bit of time to catch up to. The third word of the subtitle, 
memorial. At times, seems to echo from thoughts of the enormous number of innocent Vietnamese who were killed in the war, of his respect for the resilience and survival of the main Vietnamese who were first joyous and later jaded by the American dream, but mostly of his love, his admiration, and his honor felt toward his father, Ba, B-A, and especially his mother, Ma, whom he adored and found her final years enormously heartbreaking. In its mixture of, and frequent remixture of remembering, he writes those as two words, remembering, almost like putting your body parts or the pieces of your mind back together, remembering. That and the fragile balancing of appreciation of America, of course, on the one hand, and yet disrespect for the country's duplicity and duplicitousness. A man with two faces is at times gut-wrenching, must admit. At times, it's a tightrope walk of tenseness, especially this state. At times, humorous, believe it or not, and at all times, all times, starkly honest. I am very pleased that this most original American writer has put on paper his many, many ambivalent, unhappy memories and happy forgetting, which I hope have helped him in his processing of the tumultuous early years of his life. I really enjoyed the book, despite its being a tough experience. I shall read from sections of the book by um, structuring the book as though he were himself and also referring to him as you, this <laughs> duplicity here, um, the book becomes rather episodic and uh, he goes, he jumps around a bit uh, as he remembers things. So he will write about some part of their family life or whatever and suddenly we're on a different path because he, he, not you, he is remembering something that connects to that. So I'm going to be a little episodic as well, uh, just to give you the feeling of, of writing of, uh, of this man. I'm not going to do anything uh, different with my reading uh, from the words on the left side of the page, as they normally are. <laughs> and the words on the right side of the page, which again represent his inner thoughts about what he's just written. I shan't do that. I'm sure you'll be able to tell that. And I'm going to start at the beginning uh, for a few pages and then uh, sort of jump around a bit. So back to memory. When does memory begin? What memory is it that I seek? And where on the thin border between history and memory can I remember myself? Memory begins with Ba Ma, his parents. Their images like photographs, their story like a movie, the kind found in the black box of a VHS tape in an era when I have long ago gotten rid of my VCR. All our parents should have movies made of their lives, or at least my parents should. Their epic journey deserves star treatment, even if only in an independent low budget film. Beautiful Joan Chen in her prime would play my mother, the young heartthrob Russell Wong, my father. So, what if either man, either at neither actor is Vietnamese? 
We're all Asians here. Joan Chen did play a Vietnamese mother in a big budget Heaven and Earth, Oliver Stone's biopic about Lee Lai Hay Slip, a Vietnamese peasant girl caught in the whirlwind of a terrible war. Sexy Russell, with his chiseled cheeks and pouty lips, could have been a major star if Hollywood ever cast Asian American men as romantic leads. His slicked backed hair reminds me of my father's in a black and white headshot from the 1950s, his hair a gleam. I, whose unending obsession with the styling and maintenance of my hair begins at 16, should have asked Ba when he could still remember what hair product he used. I could try to fix my own hair in that same fashion the way I tried on my mother's gray sweatshirt after she died and discovered that I could fit inside its void. In this movie flickering in my mind's musty theater, the songs are composed by the legend Trin Kong Sun and sung by his equally legendary muse with the smoky voice, Khan Li. Their collaborations constitute the soundtrack of nostalgia and loss for Vietnamese exiles and refugees, played on cassette tapes at 45 minutes aside, filtered through a haze of cigarette smoke and accompanied by Hennessy VSOP cognac. Wong Kar Wei directs in his typically moody, seductive way. The lighting, dim. The mood, romantic, the color scheme, faded Polaroid. And the actor who plays me, a cute little boy with big black eyes. After the movie comes and goes, he is never heard from again. No one remembers his name. Perhaps Wong Kar Wai and his cinematographer Christopher Doyle could cast their cinematic spell on our house by the freeway in San Jose. Stained a dark brown, perhaps meant to evoke tree bark, built from wood and shingles, stucco and silence, memory and forgetting. Imagine the realtor's shock when my parents, refugees not fluent in English, paid in full with cash. For most refugees and immigrants, life is rented rooms or rented homes, overcrowded apartments or overstuffed houses, extended families and necessary tenants, cluttered rooms, bare lives. This is how Faye Mayan Noon describes immigrant living in her novel Bone. Her setting is an unexotic Chinatown, but at least it's in coastal San Francisco. Who has ever written about provincial San Jose, an hour's drive away, or shined the light of cinema on it? At least Dion Warwick celebrated the city with a song, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? Of course, it's not as good as the songs about San Francisco. Our street didn't even possess a name, like the Mango Street of Sandra Cisnados. Just a direction and a number. South 10th, black iron bars on the windows. Our countrymen from the old world must have installed those bars since they could not be opened from inside, trapping us in the event of fire. I blame our countrymen, always taking the shortcut. When some of them pour a cement patio for us, they forget to smooth it, leaving a surface with the texture of the moon. With a classic San Jose flourish, the people who buy the house from us later pave the lawn for more parking. My mother used to recline on that lawn, posing to have her picture taken by my father. Our American photos were almost always in color, unlike most of our Vietnamese photos, where a glamorous haze illuminates my parents. My mother, on a grassy slope by a church, is resplendent in one of her men, many ao dai. My father, slim as one of today's Korean pop stars, leans with his hip against his Toyota sedan. 
his sunglasses have disappeared, dust blown away and all the lost detritus of our past. I could wear them now, be just as fashionable on Sunset Boulevard as he was with his automobile. Most people owned only motorbikes, if they had even that much. Even today, in the place where I come from, more people drive motorbikes than cars. As one joke puts it, what do you call a Vietnamese minivan? A motorbike. In a black and white Nick Boot photograph on my living room wall, not the one of Phan Chi Kim Phu, burned by napalm, running and screaming. A man drives a motorbike, fleeing a battle. Two boys in front of him, wife behind, clutching another boy. Two more boys behind her, staring at Nick Boot's camera. In a flickering single frame of memory, a family employee drives me to preschool on a motorbike. You stood in front of him on his Vespa 50, my father told me a few years ago. I wish I had a photograph of me with the wind in my hair, a perfect shot for Wong Kar Wai to capture as we zoom past sun-brown men paddling their yik lo or driving three-wheeled Labretta taxis. Seatbelt? Car belt? Helmets? Ha! Huh. This was Vietnam. If I were to ask Ba now if he remembered this memory, I'm afraid he would say no. So I stay silent. Ba is the family documentarian. His camera recorded our first house in a middle-class suburb of Harrisburg, where we lived for our first three years in the United States. But he did not memorialize our second house on a busy two-lane road in the middle of the city. Red brick with renters upstairs, white parents whose little girl plays with me on the couch the previous owner abandoned in the yard. My brother and I share a room. He listened to 70s hit like Hotel California, which Vietnamese males of his generation were required to memorize. I call the kitchen the chicken, making my father laugh during that brief interval when his English was better than mine. South 10th was the third house, another step toward the blinking red neon sign the American dream, beckoning us forward across the dark plains of this republic. My parents crossed those plains by jet after hearing about San Jose, California from their good friend, Bak Pui, who had fled with my mother from our hometown. Warmer weather, better opportunities, many more of our countrymen. So, in 1978, we moved. Thank God. Just kidding, Harrisburg. I don't even believe in God. No, I really am just kidding, Harrisburg. I was happy with you, state capital, Pennsylvania. But a seven-year-old, so long as someone loves him, can be happy anywhere, even if it is only 15 miles from Three Mile Island. Site of the worst nuclear disaster in the United States, the meltdown occurring a year after we left. And so what if San Jose has a song and you don't, Harrisburg? No one needs directions to San Francisco. Dionne Warwick herself admitted, <laughs> it's a dumb song and I didn't want to sing it. Still her song won a Grammy, sold millions was a global top 10 hit in 1968. While people sang along to their home hi-fis or in the comfort of wood panel station wagons, American soldiers commanded by a Mexican-American captain murdered 504 Vietnamese civilians in My Lai, three years before my birth. My country continues killing innocents on the day I first revised these words. The Pentagon admits to civilian casualties in Somalia for third time. The victim is Nurto Pusao Omar Apukar, 
dead five months earlier in the town of Jalib in a strike targeting members of the Shabab, an extremist group linked to Al-Qaeda. Nurdo Kuza Omar Abukar, 18-year-old girl, initially reported as a terrorist by AFRICOM, killed by a GBU-69B small glide munition manufactured by Dynetics, which provides responsive, cost-effective engineering scientific and IT solutions to the national security, cybersecurity, space, and critical infrastructure security net sectors. My brother says he knew one of the children, a former classmate. Years later, I visit Son Mai, as the Vietnamese call the village of the massacre. Cement pathways wind through the village marked with trails of footprints, symbolizing the absent dead, the living ghosts. I am careful not to walk in their footprints. And a new chapter, you are refugees, not exiles. You are refugees, not expats. You are refugees, not migrants. You are refugees, not immigrants. You are many, not few. You are many, not one. But though you are a horde, you are also nothing, you refugees. Perhaps some of the refugees of World War II received the Hollywood treatment, but very few Hollywood movies feature you, the refugees of the last few decades, though your lives have everything Hollywood desires, drama, tragedy, war, romance, separated lovers, orphan children, divided families, impossible odds, heartwarming stories of reunion and success. Ignore the ones not reunited, the ones not successful. But, but this is a big but. You refugees lack one crucial element Hollywood needs. You are not white. You own a house or rent an apartment. You live with your family or by yourself. You wake in the morning and drink your coffee or tea. You drive a car or a motorbike, or perhaps you take the bus. You go to work and turn on your computer. You go out at night and flirt, date. You watch movies and television shows and fantasize about seeing yourself on screen. You live in a small town or a big city or maybe in the countryside. You have hopes, dreams, expectations. You take your humanity for granted. You still believe you are a human when catastrophe renders you homeless. Smoke and fire shroud your town or city or countryside. You drive, run, walk, or catch a bus to the border or the sea. Only then, having fled, hoping to leave, or making it across the border of the sea, on foot, on boat, on raft, on truck. Do you understand that those who are not refugees see you refugees as the zombies of the world? The undead rising from dying states to march or swim toward the borders of the living in endless, frightening waves. Those on the other side do not see you as human at all. This is the dread experience of joining the world's 103 million forcibly displaced people, as the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees calls them. The refugees from Russia's invasion of Ukraine receive a more hospitable welcome because they are a rarity. They are white. 
Perhaps Hollywood might even make a movie about the odyssey of Ukrainian refugees fleeing to Mexico, Mexico and claiming asylum at the U.S. border, starring Angelina Jolie as a bedraggled but still beautiful refugee. But Hollywood will probably not make a movie about the African refugees fleeing from Ukraine, abused at the Polish border, or the Central American refugees kept waiting at the U.S. border while white Ukrainians pass on through. The nation of the displaced looms larger than New Zealand or Ireland, Norway or Denmark, Singapore or Hong Kong, Switzerland or Austria, Portugal or Greece, Belgium or the Netherlands, Taiwan or Australia, South Korea or the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia or Spain, Italy or France, Cambodia or Thailand, Germany or Iran. Why even compare yourself to a nation? People hate you. To find themselves against you, no longer part of a nation. Reminder of the fragility of homes and nations. A threat to the existence of nations. Even if they do not hate you, they see you as a crisis. You refugees. The station of displaced persons is a little larger than Vietnam. 97 million people, the world's 15th largest nation. Despite their demure appearance, your people really enjoy procreating. But as much as they might be driven by Eros, perhaps Thanatos also haunts them, shadowed as they are by three million war deaths and the hundreds of thousands of maybe millions of deaths who preceded them from the other conflicts, famine, and colonization of the previous hundred years. You are proud of your lustful, fertile people, you who were one of them until you were displaced, displaced, displaced. This place that is no place, that is still your place. The forcibly displaced include the internally displaced and asylum seekers, as well as 32.5 million refugees as a nation larger than Malaysia, smaller than Angola. The countries sending forth or forcing out the most refugees are the Syrian Arab Republic, Venezuela, Ukraine, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. Force and violence beat refugees into existence. Fear and terror shape refugees. Things are done to refugees before they do things like flee, escape, say please, and thank you. As for the European Jews who survived the Holocaust and became refugees, Hannah Arendt wrote, we were told to forget, and we forgot quicker than anybody ever could imagine. You have done your best to forget. You've become very good at forgetting. And now it is difficult having forgotten so many parts of yourself and those you love, to remember your many disremembered pieces. The countries hosting the most refugees are Turkey, Colombia, Germany, Pakistan, and Uganda. Until the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the West had not welcomed most of the world's refugees since World War II, despite the cries of some Westerners that too much is asked of the generous, liberal, cosmopolitan West, which has, among other civilized accomplishments, invented the fork. So much easier to use than chopsticks, so much cleaner than one's hand. As well as the napalm dropped on Phan Thai Kim Phu 
the camera and the film that recorded her burned and naked and the entire apparatus of mechanical reproduction that etched her into people's memories all over the world to the point that her face and body now stand in for Vietnam. Country of war, country of victims, deserving of pity from the West and most of the rest. Are you a Westerner? You must be a Westerner. San Jose is in the West. And you know the way to San Jose. You were born in Ban Mi Thut, now spelled Guan Mi Thut or Guan Ma Thut. Its name changed by the victors along with many other things. Get rid of French influences, restore some cynicized roots, or just renamed after new heroes. Saigon becomes Ho Chi Minh City. And if you land in an airport and call it Phai Tuong instead of San Bai, and if you call a bank Na Bank instead of Gan Yang, people will know you left in 1975. As for your hometown, Guan Ma Thu, is closer to Guan Ama Thu, the name used by the people who first lived there, the E.D. You remember nothing of what the New York Times called the sleepy, charming Highlands Village, where the last emperor, Boao Dai, once had hunting lodges. By the time you were born, American military advisors occupied those lodges. American-made jeeps and trucks rumbled through paved two-lane roads and streets driven by southern soldiers. Ban Mi Thut has changed, but when President Ngo Dinh Diem visited in 1957, around the time Ba Ma moved there, the town was little more than a village with dirt roads, known for its coffee, its waterfalls, and its ethnic minorities, including the Ra De who padded barefoot through its streets or rode on hulking elephants. The Rade are now the Ede. You, an ethnic minority in the United States, are the majority, the kin in Vietnam. The kin are an imperial warlike people who marched south from China to seize the lands of the Cham, the Cambodians, and dozens of indigenous Highlander peoples whom the French called Mortagnards. You called them Moy, savage. You, the colonizer, now colonized by the French. Staff the French colonial bureaucracy, almost white, but not quite. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Ma takes you to the Phu Duc airport with the burnt orange control tower and small terminal the length of two or three railroad cars. If a movie was made of your family's epic refugee journey, most likely a low budget passion project by a Vietnamese filmmaker with a diasporic history like yourself, it would begin with a quiet prelude in early March, 1975 when your handsome father boards a plane for Saigon on business. He carries a briefcase with gold and cash to buy a house in Saigon. The plan is for you and your brother to be educated there instead of your provincial hometown. Perhaps Ba hugs you in farewell, for you have just turned four and are still in need of hugs. Perhaps you wave bye-bye and watch his plane take off from the red earth runway, soaring past the military helicopters and transport planes. You return to your home to the west of the airport on Ama Trang Long Street. Your family's quarters are above the family business. This one sells jewelry and auto parts and evolved from the original business with which Ba Ma began their ascent a one-stop shop where Ma sold cloth and Ba did the tailoring, a first-of-its-kind innovation in the local economy. You are unaware that you are about to enter history. 
Not far away, the communist army is assembling 19 divisions to launch its decisive surprise invasion of the South. Its first target, Ban Mi Fu. You are grateful for all those things you do not remember. You do not remember the artillery barrage that begins at 3 a.m. on March 9, the sapper attacks on the Kunduk airport, the gun battles between northern and southern troops, the latter armed with M16s and protected by American helmets. The sounds of war would be familiar to Ma, parts of town having been burned down almost exactly seven years before, in February 1968, during the Tet Offensive. Decades later, at a stranger's suburban party in San Gabriel Valley, California, the host pulls out an AK-47 and shoots into the ground to ring in the new year. The clamor is deafening. You can feel the impact of the bullets on the ground as the gunner empties his magazine. Multiply by a thousand to generate the volume and the velocity of flying metal and the fear your mother felt. You leave the party as fast as you can after the 20-something host walks around with the AK-47, shaking hands. Your friends tell you he frowns as you leave, but you don't care. You're a coward. You intend to stay that way. An image of northern soldiers in olive green uniforms and pit helmets sitting on tanks flashes out of your ocean of amnesia. But no picture of your mother, frantic as she is unable to call your father, all lines of communication cut. Ma makes a decision. She flees with Bak Kei, your 10-year-old brother, and you, leaving behind your 16-year-old adopted sister to guard the family property. Your mother believes your family will return. The war has gone back and forth for years. Why would it end now? The lesson you learn in San Jose. The Vietnamese are not Americans. Americans are, by default, white. Black and Latino people may be Americans, but Vietnamese people call them Black or Mexican. Vietnamese people are frank about white people behind their backs, but are deferential to their faces. In America's obsession over a Black-white binary, are you Black, white, or neither? The model minority understands its place in the racial hierarchy of this country and the world, at least from a colonizer's perspective. Whites on top, Asians next, then Latinos, from lighter to darker shades. Whether the bottom is black or native is debatable. The model minority is grateful not to be black rarely even thinks, thinks about not being native. You are the model minority's newest model. In 1975, Richard Pryor put you in your place. White folks tired of your ass too. They getting them some new Negroes. The Vietnamese, <laughs> laughter and applause, but bring them over. Bring them all go over. Negroes won't mind. They didn't ask us shit, and the mother got to give the jobs up for them. Obviously, I changed a few words. America always needs new others to provide the cheapest labor, to absorb the racism, to shame older others for not working hard enough and not singing loud enough in the American chorus. If Pryor's language still shocks, still violates the border of the unspeakable, then perhaps that is because he refuses the piety of polite language or censored words to describe the inherent 
fundamental obscene violence and murderousness of American life. One that has always required both the death of others and the disremembering of those deaths. But Pryor, like many Americans, does not know about or forgets Laos, where dozens of thousands of Hmong, <clears throat> perhaps even one quarter of all Hmong men and boys, sorry, allied with the Americans, were killed in combat. The United States repaid Hmong's sacrifice by abandoning most of the Hmong. Are the ones who make it to America grateful? What is more obscene, the deaths of the Hmong or the American expectation that the survivors be grateful? The model minority expresses its gratitude partly by being successful, validating the American dream by becoming doctors, lawyers, engineers. What about police officers? You trace the roots of your vanity and weakness, your amusement at visiting the halls of power and your curiosity about them your contradictory Groucho Marx and Karl Marxisms, your existence as a man of two faces who might be a spy, a sleeper, a spook, to your refugee origins and coming of age in the era of Ronald Reagan, himself a man of two faces. Perhaps the ultimate late 20th century embodiment of both the quiet American and the ugly American. D-list actor and president of America from 1980 to 1988, the Republican saint and the co-star of Bedtime for Bonzo, along with the chimpanzee, defines your childhood and adolescence, the years when you suffer the requisite emotional damage necessary to becoming a writer, or at least your kind of writer. Your 1980s overlap with your San Jose, where you lived from 1978 to 1988, arriving three years after the end of St. Ronald's governorship of California, the largest state of the 50 United States, if one does not count the invisible 51st, the state of denial. You spend your adult life in greater Los Angeles, but San Jose remains your emotionally radioactive core inseparable from Ba Ma. This decade is the second longest period of her American years when your mother is completely herself. In your 1980s, Ba Ma loom over you, always immense, emerge from nowhere, natural outcroppings of towering strength. The idea that Ba Ma might once have been children or weak or ill hardly ever occurs to you except when your mother tells you about the famine. No matter how often you look at yourself in the mirror, your eyes do not seem slanted, but perhaps those with slanted eyes cannot see their own slant. You write your first op-ed for the college newspaper condemning Miss Saigon. A friend tells you that one of the most beloved English professors, whom you also like, does not approve. Perhaps you wrote a terrible piece. Perhaps you are a barbarian or a Philistine. Or perhaps the professor thinks someone else is you. That someone else is the other, Viet Win. Also an English major, he is short and gay and looks nothing like you, or he looks exactly like you, depending on who is looking. The other Viet Wins professor dislikes him and thinks you are him when you apply for graduate school. For this, you almost do not get a fellowship, which would prevent you from accepting Berkeley's offer of admission. Or perhaps the professor didn't appreciate your application. Influenced by the Marxist literary critic Terry Eagleton's literary theory, 
You believe something must be done. Literary criticism, you argue, can change the world. Or youthful illusion. You do not realize that your criticism can never hope to change the world if you cannot also change yourself. Thirty years later, you write another co-op, co-op uh, op-ed about the revival of Miss Saigon, this time for the New York Times. Challenging art with politics and vice versa brings out the critics then and now. Your hate mail has a common theme. How dare you reduce art and love to politics? How dare you trample freedom of speech and artistic freedom and America? with your Soviet, Russian, Chinese, Maoist, North Korean, totalitarian writers, union, authoritarian, communist, socialist, Marxist, anti-American drivel. These freedom-loving critics would likely love the brave dissident writers of China, North Korea, Russia, and look down on the apolitical conformist writers of those regimes. But is nothing in the West worthy of political wrath when it comes to art and writing? It must be so wonderful to be free of anger, to have nothing threatened by the outrages committed by your society, to have never been on the receiving end of your society's wars, police actions, missiles, guns, bombs, whips, nooses, batons, Coups, death, squads, black sites, laws, statues, policies, epithets, jokes, gazes, denials, and silence. All around you in your gorgeous state in the audience are audience members weeping at the climactic spectacle at Miss Saigon, the heartbreaking tragedy of an Asian woman killing herself for a white man and giving him their child. There's even a Huey helicopter, like the one that landed on the roof of Saigon to rescue desperate Vietnamese, like the ones from which American soldiers slaughtered innocent Vietnamese. When your lovely companion is equally unmoved, disgusted, really, you sense that you have made the right choice and vice versa. Lan, your future wife and first reader, an aspiring scholar and an aspiring writer like yourself, takes a photo of you gagging under the marquee, a document now lost or otherwise you would share it because you are that kind of person. 30 years later, the writerly you digs up Kensington's letter, the teacher I so and admired and reminds me with this reread. I believe you are trying again and again to approach the heart of your story, Motherlands in the Hospital, but you have not gotten to the center of things. My observation is that you seem alienated and depressed. You said that falling asleep in class is your normal behavior. I think it is a sign of withdrawing and not functioning. Taking joy in life and being generous in the giving of yourself such as giving praise or criticism to other students, are healthy states that I want for you to work on and achieve. Did you notice that I asked you to give me questions? There are no questions in your letter. Questions are creative and dangerous. To ask a question is to be open to change. For you to be a good writer, yet you need to be open, engaged, speaking, hearing, awake. These are the questions you should have asked yourself. Are you in fact alienated and depressed? Can you be generous to your fellow writers? Can you be open, engaged, speaking, hearing, awake, especially if you have never been before? Can you get to the heart of the story? Can you go where it hurts? Can you cut to the bone? New chapter, and you and me, such an odd couple. The duplicity issue. 
The only way I've been able to write about myself is through writing about you. You are me. But seen from a slight distance, or the greatest distance, which is the space between one and oneself. You are my excuse to write about me, because I find myself too boring to go on about, and also too frightening to think about. What kind of person is capable of the disremembering I have done to myself and to others, like my adopted sister? like my mother. Only through writing about you can I attempt to remember not only you, but also myself. And perhaps in writing and remembering, you and me engaged in this delicate dialectic can become something greater than the sum of our disjointed parts. If remembering has proven so difficult for you and me, can either of us be blamed for forgetting? Americans who continually struggle to be greater than the sum of their parts live in a culture of forgetfulness, that 51st state of denial. This is a country where so many would rather not remember what the poet William Carlos Williams calls the orgy of blood, from which the nation was born and that still soaks the land so many citizens, including those who were once refugees, continue to profit from. And finally, back to memory. Of his own fading father in his final years, Philip Roth wrote, to be alive to him is to be made of memory. To him, if a man's not made of memory, he's made of nothing. Perhaps true, but nothing is something. Neither exists without the other. Presence in need of absence, positive requiring negative. From nothing we come and from nothing we return. As refugees, we came from that terrifying void between nations where we were cast out. Emerging from that void of the other, how were we refugees to be seen by the people of nations except as nothing? Well, a man of two faces, highly complicated. Highly complicated about what is still at age 45 when he wrote the book. Uh, still very fresh, very torn, many wounds yet to be resolved, it seems to me, in my humble opinion. The two parts of himself, the two ways of looking at each issue, that's usually good, but he's torn. I think this is the word torn. The country's torn, he's torn, his mind is torn, his vision is of life and America is torn. He's highly successful now, though, and has been for several years at the university. Um, so it's really perhaps the first half of his life, first 20 years, first 22 years, that were really so challenging for him. New book, new on the shelves, A Man of Two Faces, A Memoir, A History Memorial, Viet Tan. Win. I hope it sounded interesting to you. It does to me, it did to me, it was for me, because of course I lived during that period of the Vietnam War, so much of this was very familiar to me. Anyway, that is the book in our focus and spotlight for the week. Let me take a couple of moments just to look to the future, uh, to next week, if I may. Next week, we're going to look at a book published in 2020 
But the timeliness of it is even far more important than being three years old. The timeliness of it is this. The author of that book, who has a new book, which just came out on October 31st, is the recent winner of the 2023 Nobel Prize in Literature. <laughs> Nobel Prize in Literature. John Olaf Fosse, no, it's actually Jun Fosse, Jun Fosse, there we go, is a Norwegian author, translator, and playwright. In 2023, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, quote, for his innovative plays and prose which give voice to the unsayable. Fosse's work spans over 70 novels, poems, children's books, essays, and theater plays which have been translated into over 50 languages. The most performed Norwegian playwright after Heinrich Ibsen. Foss's book, latest book, A Shining, was released a week ago on October 31st. This is obviously the month for new books. But that did not come out soon enough for me to read it in time, so... I have gone to a favorite from 2000 called The Other Name. The Other Name, published in 2020 and, and highly regarded. Uh, the Other Name follows the lives of two men leaving, living close to each other on the west coast of Norway. The year is coming to a close, and Assel, I'll get the right pronunciations for next week. Arsel, an aging painter and widower, is reminiscing about his life. He lives alone, his only friends being his neighbor, Aslik, a bachelor and traditional Norwegian fisherman farmer, and Baia, a gallerist who lives in Bjorvin, lives another Arsel, also a painter. He and the narrator are doppelgangers, two versions of the same person, two versions of the same life. Written in hypnotic prose that shifts between the first and third person, sound familiar? The other name calls into question concrete notions around subjectivity and the self. What makes us who we are? And why do we lead one life and not another? Through flashbacks, Fossa deftly explores the convergences and divergences in the lives of both hustlers, slowly building towards a decisive encounter between them both. A writer at the zenith of his career, with the other name, the first two volumes in his Septology of Seven Books, Fossa presents us with an indelible and poignant exploration of the human condition that will endure as his masterpiece. Somewhat similar in a way, of course, to the book that I just read, and I thought it would be interesting to compare and contrast, which is why I put them back to back, not by error, but deliberately. So Norwegian novels are not too commonly read in the United States, certainly the Norwegian plays of Heinrich Gibson are performed more so in the past than in the present. Uh, but I think we shall see a very different writing style from our Vietnamese writer today, Vietnamese American writer today, and the Norwegian writer on a topic of some similarity. I hope you'll join me. I think a compare and contrast will be very interesting. Thank you very much for being with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you did, please press that little icon there, the thumbs up. It's a little vote of confidence for us. <laughs> you may also wish to share it, which gives you that opportunity uh, to do that with a friend. And offer a comment, either about the book, another book you may have read uh, by uh, Viet Nguyen, uh, or about subject matter, memories you may have, um, or your favorite book. We're putting together our December list, and so perhaps you'd like to share with us your favorite book and uh, see if it fits into the, uh, into the monthly schedule. And also, uh, if you would, we would love to have you subscribe. 
Subscribe usually implies money of some sort, a magazine or newspaper. In this case, not so. It simply asks you for your email address so that we can send you updates on programs at the Gamden Public Library, which is forever busy. <clears throat> so please do subscribe. It also gives us a vote of confidence and keeps us in the number one spot in the state of Maine among all public libraries, small, medium, and large, with the highest number of subscribers to our program's YouTube channel. We've been there for a year, and we're quite proud of that since we're not a very big library, as you may know. So you're pressing that button and sharing your email address uh, would be very valuable to us. We'd like to go into the new year coming up soon, uh, also in first place. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of autumn. I understand the snow is expected by the end of the week. Um, probably not, but we've got to get used to that word, I suppose. Um, stay healthy, especially in this shoulder season. Lots of illnesses going around at the moment and lots of vaccinations going around at the moment as well, if you choose that route. Above all, if you have the choice, and I realize that not everyone does have the choice, uh, Try hard to be positive. Such a negative world we live in at the moment, God knows, on our own shores and across the big ponds in both directions. So if you can, try to share a little positive energy. Try to be happy if possible. Thanks so much. Goodbye.